Okay, it is 7.01 and I would like to call this meeting to order. Thank you everyone for coming to our first in-person meeting since COVID. Um, so I just wanna thank Paul Elementary for hosting our meetings. My name is Colin Peros and look forward to working with you all this term. So attending in person for the people online, we have Vice Chair Mao to my right. We have Sergeant at Arms member Siraki. We have board members Hack, um, Turbin, and Ige. And online we have board members Kawamoto and our treasurer, board member Onishi. Um, okay, so as always, we start with monthly board meetings. Uh, sorry, with monthly reports from our first responders. So do we have a representative from the fire department? I'm going to give this to him. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Captain Chris Miller from the Apollo Fire Station. I'm okay. there. Yeah, I'm there on uh, third watch. So I'll go over the incident statistics for September. You guys can hear me okay. Uh, so the statistics for September, uh, we had uh, no fires, uh, 40 medical calls, one motor vehicle collision, um, and three... One, one motor vehicle collision with a pedestrian and three motor vehicle crash co collisions over the month of September. Uh, the fire safety tip uh, for the month is it, this month's our fire prevention month. Um, so, which is it's observed from October 8th through the 14th. So a lot of the fire stations are going out to this, uh, this elementary schools to promote awareness. Um, as the campaigns promoted throughout the month of October, this year's themes cooking safety. Uh, it starts with ourselves, um, so we want to pay attention um, to fire prevention. Uh, the question is, do most people know that cooking fires are the leading cause of home fires and fire injuries? So unattended cooking is the leading cause of cooking fires and deaths. What can we do? Um, the good news is we can prevent most of these fires and burns, and one of the one safety tip is to turn the pot handles towards the back of the stove. A lot of people forget that. I even have to remind my wife to do that still. And she lives in the house with me as a fireman for over 23 years. She still leaves it out. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to get her to change that habit. But um, always keep the lid on near uh, lid nearby when you're cooking. That way you can cover a grease fire if it if it starts to burn. Um, watch what you heat, uh, set a timer. So a lot of people leave the stove, they forget, you know, that something's been in there. If you have a timer, the alarm goes off and you get, and it'll remind you to get back in there. Um, if you had a, have a kid in pet free zone, at least 3 feet around the stove, kind of make that a no go zone for your kids. Um, where hot food and drinks can be uh, spilt on them. Uh, so the, yeah, those are the tips. Uh, that's all I had for today. Okay, thanks, Captain Miller. Do we have any questions from the board members? Oh, I got. You can hear me, Chad? Can you hear me? Yeah. What? He can hear you. I can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Chad, can you hear me? Chris. Chris. Sir. His name is Chris Miller. Yeah. Chris. Uh, yes, you know, you know when you guys make the when you guys come up to the Apollo uh, Chinese home, you know, because of uh, somebody's hurt inside there. Uh huh. Uh, you you familiar with that? Going up to the Chinese home, yeah, we we have uh, quite a few calls up there. Right. The thing I'm trying to tell you, I live right on the corner. Okay. When you uh -huh. guys come up, when you get siren, huh? Don't turn up the siren. Until you make the turn into the Palolo Chinese home, mm -hmm. they, got a, they got a big turn over there, and I don't want any car hitting you guys or getting hurt. They got, yeah, you know, it's that's a big turn where I stopped there. Where I, it's supposed to be 15 miles an mm -hmm. hour driving, but people going up there 20, 25, 30. But yeah. Keep the siren on them. Let the ambulance know about that too now. The ambulance mm -hmm. comes right after you guys. Okay. Yeah. So, so leave the, you guys always stop the siren before you guys make the big U turn. Into uh, leave the siren on until you 
until you inside the property in turn them off. Just for one. Yeah, that's a good, a good suggestion. Um, we, um, yeah, so we have 3 captains over here. I'm not sure how each captain does it, but we also have, uh, you know, our policy and procedures that we have to follow. Um, we, when we get to hospital settings, like the Palolo Chinese home, which it is, um, we can use our discretion if we're observing, uh, the speed limit and we're staying within that. And sometimes we'll run, uh, we might run no siren that night. Uh, and that's that's because we're observing and we we have to basically abide by all traffic laws if we're not using our sirens. Um, and it depends on the emergency. So it's emergency driven. If it's just a, a BLS call where we're uh, helping just to move a patient, we won't run our sirens. Um, but if it's a um, uh, true emergency, we will we are going to leave our sirens on the whole time. Um, and. I'd say my guys are pretty good. Uh, we leave it on pretty much all the way up into that point that you're talking about. And we're aware of that. Um, it, it, that is a sharp corner over there. So, yeah, I understand your concern. What I'm saying is you guys come up with the siren all the way up to the big uh -huh. turn. You just turn them off. What I'm saying is don't turn it off until you make the turn. So, so like I said, I there's saw. other. There's no, there's other, other there. firefighters, other ambulances that go up in there. So when you say you guys, I, I'll take that as myself as well. But I can say I don't turn it off with my crew. So I can pass it on to the other guys. Uh, we'll let them know. But uh, again, we have to abide by the by our by our policy and procedures. And it's actually up to the captain's discretion sometimes. So if they're safely driving, we don't have to blare the siren the whole time. So that's that's just that's our policy and procedure. That we're following. Yeah, let's let's try. I understand let's your concern. Procedures. I, I I trust I trust their procedures. Let's yeah. let's move forward. It, it's, not, it's not procedure. Okay. I I trust. Okay. And safety. Okay. okay. Right on the big turn away. Up. Right here. Huh? Why are you turning off your siren? I I haven't I turned off the siren, so you're asking you're, 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 you're kind of uh, asking the wrong guy. So if it's yeah, if you have an actual day and time of somebody turning it off. Man. We could address it. Okay. Thank you, Captain. Thank Miller. you, Captain. So, yeah, thank you, you guys. Um, okay. Looks like Board Member Kalamoto has a question. So, uh, Juanita, do you have your hand raised because you have a question? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, you know, concerning the Lahaina fires and looking at how things went and lack of preparation in certain areas. Uh, how does, does Palolo have a plan? Should things like that occur on the dry areas like the mountain sides? Or is there something that's always in the works that I, I like to think that Oahu is really well prepared in the sense that there's so many um, stations that could come yeah. to help if it got out of control, but I'd like to know yeah. what kind of plan you folks have. Mahalo. There, yeah, there, thank, thank you for the question. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always a, a plan. We have, um, we practice our wildland procedures. Um, there's, you know, there's more frequent wildland fires on uh, like the Waianae side. Um, that unfortunately with the Lahaina fire, that was a wind driven fire. Um, that was, they had their hands full and they were short manpower. They don't have the same manpower that we have here. Not to say that that couldn't happen here. Um, if, but that's just something that you have to go defensive right away. If it's going to be wind pushed, um, an evacuation has to be made. So, uh, we've started to address a couple different things. Um, since that happened, um, everybody's going to learn some things from it. Um, I'm fortunate enough. I've been in HFD for over 23 years. I also was a wildland firefighter for five years before that. So I, I do understand how bad and big those can get and how dangerous they are. Um, Palolo, the valley to get back over here, it's, it's pretty green. Um, so that does help a lot because this is, a, it's a raining valley. Uh, it does start to dry out in the summer times a little bit, but. If the winds were pushing a certain way and it did happen, if it was, uh, depending on what caused the fire, we have to jump on it right away. We do have a lot of water sources. 1 of the other concerns is up Lai road. 
uh, that our access up there is not very good. There's certain roads that we can't even drive on up there. Um, but the, the housing is a little bit more spaced out. Um, so that's something the residents up there have to realize that it's going to take us a little bit uh, if something does happen. But and f the other fortunate side is it is very green up there. Um, but yeah, we um, we have we have plans in place of how to how to fight the fire. And our next arriving companies are usually right behind us. So um, yeah, thank you for the question. Hey, Captain Miller, thank you for that answer. Can you hear me? I yes. can hear you. We gotta go right she muted herself. She muted Remember, herself. Tomoto, you muted yourself. Am I okay now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Last yes. question I have is Hawaii doesn't have a fire marshal. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And is that something that we as a board and community can push for as we go forward to the way things are becoming now when we talk about global problems and fire? Yeah, that um, that is it is definitely something that probably can be pushed through legislation. Um, I'm not that privy to the politics side, but um, it is something that uh, we we hear words about. You know, them talking about having a fire marshal. Um, right now, we we have our prevention bureau. The way we enforce, you know, that would the the fire marshal would probably help for enforcing um more residential stuff but um and enforcing the code but we've 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 been pretty effective just with uh we we try to do a lot of education uh to get you know to to get people to abide by fire code you know like trimming back like if their yards are overgrown and things like that we try to get that word out but um it is challenging it definitely is um because hawaii's uh you know, the vegetation grows, it, you cut it, it grows right back. Thank you. You're welcome. Question. Thank you, Captain Sorry, Miller. Yeah. Okay. Let's, Chris. It's very old after you get more questions. Why wasn't the fire alarm siren on? Which siren? Okay, so let's keep on, um, I, I think the question was about the Maui fire, so let's keep it just the, the Maui fire. Why yeah. wasn't the siren on? Which Captain side? Miller, you don't need to answer because you don't report to the people who made that decision. So let's just keep the questions directly related to our community. Um, so we'll move on. Thank you, Captain Miller. Do we have a question? Yeah, you. you're welcome. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Have a good we, night. Thank you, you too. Okay, do we have a representative from the police department? Uh, yes. We're, good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so Lieutenant Mayor from District 7, um, provide the uh, statistics. So motor vehicle thefts, we have 10, burglary 6, thefts 9, and unauthorized entry into motor vehicles 9. Uh, total calls for service um, in excess of 6,300. Um, regarding the, the safety tips, being that it is October and Halloween is right around the corner. Um, so tips for trick or treaters, secure emergency identification, name, address, phone number, discreetly within costumes or on a bracelet. And everyone should have a flashlight to be seen and to also see as well. Uh, good, another good example, if you don't, people don't have a flashlight, a good thing is people can turn on their cell phones. Uh, just they, a lot of them have a light, flashlight app where you can kind of walk around just to be seen. It helps with that as well. If people forget a flashlight or they don't have a flashlight. Uh, a tip for a parent is to know who your children will be with and have their parents contact numbers. Young children should be accompanied by an adult always. Okay, and that's it for the tips. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant Mura. Um, just a reminder, especially for the um, speakers on Zoom, if you could please state your name. Um, before you talk. So, do we have any questions from board members? What's your name? Miura. 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 Yes. Miura. Okay. You know anything about guys 
soliciting money for the police department nationwide. Are you got so uh, soliciting money from the public? Are are we soliciting money for the public? Yes. Is that true? Uh, not, not to my knowledge, no. In what kind? You said nationwide. Like I don't. What do you right. mean nationwide? The question is that because someone is calling, talk to me about him that he wants some contribution money. So this is to help the police department. Okay. To me, it sounds like a okay. scam. Okay. You right. Don't know anything yeah. about that? Yeah, I would say. I would uh, I personally don't, I seriously doubt it that the department would do anything like that. So more than likely it's, it's a scam. I don't know the exact context of your call, but I would, um, I would shy away from anything like that. So, so I mean, can you report that to the police department? Because what I mean, they call in all the public, so whoever is 70 or what. Okay. So let the people know about them that you guys are not doing that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other questions from the board. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, Lieutenant. What is it, Lieutenant? Mira. Mira. Thank you. Is there a representative from the Board of Water Supply? Hi. Right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Dominic Diaz. Yep. Hi, Dominic Diaz. On a little Board of Water Supply. Uh, I'll make this quick. No main breaks or construction activities to report. So just a quick general announcement. On Saturday, the 21st, the Board of Water Supply will be observing the Imagine a Day Without Water. Uh, there are over 15 city, state, community organizations that will have interactive booths and activities, uh, food, games, prizes. They'll be making, there'll be workshops to make janky balls. If you're not familiar, that's what they were using to help clean up the alawai. Uh, these are used to clean soils and waters. Uh, there'll be xeriscape plant activities and workshops, as well as uh, rain barrel and native uh, plant seed workshops. This Again, this is Saturday, October 21st, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Freshwater State Recreation Area out in Wahiawa. And we have more information on the event on our website, www.boardofwatersupply.com slash one water Hawaii. And if anybody has any questions for the board of water, I'd be happy to take those at this time. Thank you, Dominic. Any questions from board members? Okay, seeing Thank none, you. any questions? Oh, yeah. I see it, there's a hand raised somewhere in there. Oh. Hi, can Member you hear Kaumoro? me? Yes. Yes. Hi, this is Awanita Kawamoto. Thank you so much, Mr. Diaz. Is there any update on Red Hill and the fuel? What's happening with the fuel? Uh, nothing that I have right now. I could follow up tomorrow with our communications office. I know they've been tracking everything, you know, every step of the process. So I can see where they're at and I could contact you back if you want to give me your email in the chat or I could report back to the board at the next meeting with an update. That'd be great. An update is good. I'm sure if it was serious, it'd be out to all of us right away. We, yeah, uh, we have, you know, we have several people that are keeping very close tabs on all of the events related to Red Hill. So. I really, really appreciate that. Mahalo for your presence. Yeah. And our communications office does try to provide updates on our website. So, you know, feel free to go to our website, boardofwatersupply.com. If you type in Red Hill in the search, they usually do provide any updates. If there's, you know, if we've provided any testimony or there's upcoming opportunities for testimony, usually they'll post that information on our website. Super. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from community members? Seeing none, I will move to the next agenda. Thank you, Dominic. Okay, Dominic. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so residents com concerns or community concerns. So are there any community members who want to express a concern or question they have for the board? So to under understand this a bit, 
we can have three minutes to speak, but we can't take action on the issue you brought up. And it, it includes board members, board members of the community. What are we talking about? The community concerns. Thanks. Okay, so seeing that, we'll move to the next agenda item presentations. So today we're fortunate to have um, two leaders to share some information about their um, awesome programs. The first is Y Lee, the executive director for Smart Trees Pacific. Um, Why you are online, so you should have you should be able to share your screen and you can start presenting when you're ready. Thank you. Can everybody hear me all right and see the screen? Uh, we can hear you. The presentation is loading. The food on the future, so we can see who we're talking to. Yes, yeah, so we'll right. this is okay. Wei Li. It's loading. Oh, Wei Li, sorry, thank you. No worry, no worry. This is Wei Li. I'm the executive director for Smart Tree Pacific. Uh, please let me know if the screen is up so I can. Uh, uh, start the presentation. Yes, we can. The presentation is visible to us. Thank you. You can begin. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, board. Thank you, chair. And uh, thank you, everyone in Ololo. Allow me to uh, present our program today. We've been around for quite a while. We're a small nonprofit uh, based in Kailua, uh, where we work with the urban forest since 1992. And we have been a nonprofit since 2014. And the Citizen Forestry Program uh, is one of the, a fun program for us um, because it brings in different people all around the island and, and other islands as well. So let me give you a, like, a real background where this come from and how it all started. So in, 19, in 2009, we did a urban tree canopy assessment. And then four years later, in 2012, uh, yeah, 2012, we, we did another. And we compared the two of them. The assessment is really the Southern Oahu from uh, Waianae all the way to around the Southern Oahu, uh, right into um, Kahuku, yeah, just before Kahuku, um, just a little bit north of, um, but what we found is we have lost a great deal of canopy. And I perhaps uh, some of you have heard about study already with about 4%. Four, 4%. And that came out to 1.8 square miles of it. Um, so we were alarmed and we want to find out who did this and why is this happening to us? Uh, are we in trouble? We couldn't find a culprit. There was no major disaster. There were no policy change. Uh, it was really everybody thought we are green enough. We can take down the tree here and there. So we decided we we need a involvement I'm advocacy program. Hi, Wei. It's Colin. I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you mind speaking a little louder? Of course. Thank you. Let, let me know. Sometimes I, I got carried away and look away and not realizing I'm not talking loud enough. No, it's Thank okay. You. Thank you. Oh, sure. So we want to get the citizens involved. And instead of we talking to the citizen all the time, we need amplification. So we decided to start a citizen science program and uh, bring ordinary citizens in and ask them to help us to broadcast the message. Trees are good. Trees are important. And this is how you can help. So we started this program in 2016 and started with Kailua. Um, for in, at the same time, the city told us that they really wanted an inventory. So we set up a training program and we went on and start uh, training citizens to inventory trees for us. That's how it starts. So the goal of the program 
is to develop an inventory using citizen science. Really, we're teaching citizens the benefit of trees and the techniques and how to inventory trees. That is through tree measurements. We take 14 measurements on every tree, every site, and we help them identify trees. They learn how to identify trees based, uh, um, based on different observations they have. The leaves, the flowers, the fruits, the bark, and even the shape of the canopy helps. And then we engage community member. The next step is to care for the trees. Now we know what we have. Let's take care of them. And ultimate goal is to have increased community support. To have more advocates for the trees and not just us. So in the last few years, we trained at open over 300 citizen scientists, citizen foresters, aged from Boy Scout, I think uh, Boy Scout to senior citizens. So we have so far inventory 34,000 trees, uh, both Oahu and Kauai, and we have more than 300 uh, volunteers. And we train them how to do tree ID, and they got to meet new members, other tree, other members in the community that want to like trees, like-minded people. And uh, we got to one of the really benefit is we got to walk around and explore our own neighborhood. And even though like, we live in a town, we may be, you may not have gone to some places. So it's a great health benefit for us. We go out every week for about a couple of hours. So you get nice amount of exercise and we contribute to the uh, city county's database. So, excuse me about that. So we started with Kailua and right after Kailua, we began the, uh, uh, the wind, uh, leeward side was Manoa and Pololo. So Pololo was was done actually very, very early. We had completed Pololo first, we inventory all the trees, and then we first went back and inventory all the potential planting sites. So we have found, based on the um, guidelines provided by the city, such as 20, 15 feet from the mailbox and no overhead lines, and 25 feet from the inventory, uh, excuse me, intersection, and all the different criteria the city has. And we have a special class for our volunteers, and we went out and inventory all the um, potential planting sites. So out of the 30, uh, 570 trees in a right of way, the annual benefits or annual saving is about $2,400. And there are not that many public trees in, in Pololo. So we want to have more trees. So our, our goal is not just inventory trees. We want to plant them, to take care of them, and grow the trees, um, but in a community base, not us do a lot of work, but we work with community, help them to plant, uh, plant trees and take care of them. So if you want to be a citizen forester and you, you can uh, pick down this website and join us at this program, is actually a collaboration between the U.S. Forest Service, the state, the uh, DOFA, DLNR, and the, the Division of uh, Forestry, and the city and county of Honolulu and Kauai, and us, the nonprofits. And of course, the most important partner, our citizens. And right now, we have three group of uh, citizen forester on Oahu and one on Kauai. They work on the windward side. 
uh, two groups in the leeward side, one in the uh, Kaimaki area, and then the other one is in the uh, city in, in the Honolulu area. So that's my presentation. Is any question? Thank you, Wei. Any Thank questions you. from board members? Yes, board member Hack. Mr. Mr. Lee, uh, do uh, help the Boy Scouts get a merit badge or advancement to their work? I'm sorry, I can't quite get the uh, question. We help the Boy Scouts who participate in the program get a merit badge or advance to their rank. Oh, good question. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Boy Scout and Girl Scouts do. Uh, I think I have uh, 313, one, um, one in Manoa, and then the other one in Luwanu. Um, what we they, they are welcome to have their badges. We don't get involved with that particularly. It's the, the troop that uh, work, with the stu uh, work with them. We train the leaders. We train the scouts. We train the parents as well. So we train anybody and everybody who wants to learn about and care about trees. Okay. And then they go out, they they inventory uh, the Manoa District Park. I remember clearly there, it was a little Manoa mists we had uh, at the time. Uh, so the, the short answer is yes, we do. Thank you, Wei. Any other questions from board members? Yes, Vice Chair Ma. Uh, uh, Mr. Wei, uh, thank you for everything you're doing regarding trees, but uh, moving forward, uh, how do you propose to get more trees planted? Mm -hmm. Are you seeking organizations or working with the city or uh, how, how are you increasing the number of trees in Palolo? Thank you for the question. I, I will have, I couldn't have asked myself better questions than that. Thank you. That's actually is a big challenge for nonprofit like us. Mm -hmm. We're an outsider. We know trees. We know the benefits of trees. We work with the city, the state, but we don't know the community. So two years, uh, maybe four years ago, 2019. We, we started a uh, partnership with Kaimaki. We went in, a group of us created a hui called Trees for Kaimaki. And the Tree for Kaimaki has a local component, a community component. With the, um, I, I basically it was the, the chair of the uh, nation, nation, uh, sorry, neighborhood board, not putting columns in, in any, uh, uh, particular position here. So Sharon Schneider uh, represented Kaimaki and she worked with us and the KDPL, the Kaimaki Professional and Business Association. Mm -hmm. So we formed this community tree group and our goal was to work with, uh, to increase canopies. So this group changes the dynamic very much instead of us talking to the city, coming to Pine Tree in Palolo. We don't know anything about Palolo. We only know the rules. We don't know the people. We want people to like the tree, be happy with it, and be with us. So we did that with Kaimaki. And we have gone out. The, the Hui actually gone out to get grants. So who he got out and talked to Kaimaki Christian Church, talked to schools, the library, um, because they have the connection. We brought in the, the funding, we brought in the skills, we trained them, we the landowner, and it turns out it was a much better model to work with. We basically supplied the technology partner with a local group. And we bring in our knowledge about funding sources at state level, federal level, and our partners in city and county. So that worked out much, much better. 
So we would like to do that with Pololo. Uh, if, if Pololo would want to do that. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Wei. Thanks, Wei. Welcome. Thank you, Wei. I maybe should have gave this context before Wei started, but um, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed by Congress and signed into law earlier this summer, included $1 billion for tree planting, billion with a B, and the state is set to get about $42.5 million of that. So um, part of this presentation is to just you know bring aware that awareness to the board um, so that we can funnel as much of that as possible to our valley. So wait, we look forward to working with you to plant more trees here, basically. Thank you. We would love to. And if you are interested, happy to work with you folks and see how to get a piece of that IRA pie. Yes. Thank you. There's yeah, there is, I think, what, a million and a half dollars available in a few months. Okay, so thank you. I'm sorry. We actually have one question online from board member Kawamoto. Mahalo, Chair. Um, Aloha, Mr. Lee. Um, do you know for Palolo if there is an inventory list of historical trees? that are significant to Palolo that we can access online or where? Thank you. Yeah, great question. Uh, I believe the, the you are referring to the exceptional trees uh, being recognized, uh, the exceptional tree program. Yes, the outdoor circle, if you go to their website or Google the, the exceptional tree program on uh, Oahu or Honolulu, they have a map of all the exceptional trees on Oahu and in a state. Honolulu has the most. I don't know off the top of my head how many uh, exceptional trees in, in Honolulu. The, uh, the map should help you. And the expert in that uh, exceptional tree program is uh, Miles, Miles Ritchie. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I actually looked earlier today and I couldn't find any that had the word Pololo in the description or had our zip code, but maybe it only specified the um, my street name. Yes, Heather. Um, anyone is able to remotely treat an exceptional Oh. So for um, the person who raised the question, for any of you here, if there are trees that you think are special and you'd like to know, please do. Um, if you want more information, I can give you that from the meeting I'm on the first advisory committee that reviews those applications. It would be an honor to have them. Yeah. Thank you. So for anyone in person, what, what you can give it up to the mic so the people online can hear you as well. Okay, just the mic. <laughs> Juanita, so um, Heather, a community member, shared that she is on the committee that reviews the nominations to be registered as an exceptional tree. So um, we should encourage our neighbors to identify those trees that we can pass a resolution for inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Okay, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to speak. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next, um, let's welcome Dr. Hassiger. So Dr. Hassiger is the Director of Civic Engagement with the University of Hawaii at Manoa's College of Social Sciences and Ethnic Studies. And Dr. Hassiger runs um, basically an education pathway program and I'll, I'll let you explain the rest, but if you could come up here to the mic um, and present from here, that would be great. So if you could share the same way Wei did, if you could share um, your screen as you present. Remove that. Yes. I was so impressed, not a way. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so just right in front of the mic. Wait, wait, what is it? Are you, are you already in the meeting, yeah? Yeah. Great. So you can sit down right here. I got the camera on you already. 
to the side with this your, This is your presentation. Um, right, which is legislation yeah. where this has to prioritize the protection of all the exception units. Because that would kind of elevate the status of that program a little bit, and at least gives his some direction at a tree level. So but it's not what you said. Is that what you said? Is that what you said? Royal Palm Drive is on the next tree. Yeah. So, Aloha, and thank you for inviting me. Aloha. <laughs> this is my first neighborhood board meeting in Palolo, well, right. which is Here. remarkable. Since I worked here for 25 years. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to have you. So, You're welcome. Yeah, I have many ties in the community. Some of the children that I've worked with when I started are now parents themselves. So they come to me and say, You look familiar. Okay, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. I am an anthropologist of trade, but um, primarily working connecting students and faculty with the community and the other way. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the ways that we do this. Um, in the late 90s, we pulled together a number of different uh, activities that, uh, and collaborations between the community in Palolo and uh, UH Manoa, Kapiolani Community College, and Chaminade University of Hawaii. Some of the thinking was that um, we had Palolo Valley and particularly the public housing, or the housing, I should say now, um, and very few people from that area were actually in higher education. So the idea was, let's support this um, community in getting educated. Um, and we have done that, but we have also been educated a lot at the institutions of higher education. One of them was, one of the first uh, things we learned were, you cannot just focus on education. You have to focus on everything. You have to focus on the whole community. And uh, Kevin Say will remember us at many different activities. Can you hear me okay? Oh, if you could try to speak as loud as you can, so we can. Not my strength, but I'll try. <laughs> I'll Thanks. pretend you're at class. <laughs> we don't have microphones, right? Not your phone. It's right here. <laughs> Thanks, it's loud enough. Okay. So, um, let's see if I can get rid of this thing. Loading window. Okay. So, uh, the two ways that we connect with um, the community from higher education is to service learning and internships primarily. Um, an internship is mostly for the students to try out a career choice. Uh, it helps the community, it should help the community, but it's first and foremost about the education of the student. On the other hand, service learning is first and foremost service. So I pride myself in not starting service learning programs that are not uh, needed or requested from the community. That's very important for us. Uh, it is a so-called high impact practice of learning, which means that students that are learning with community partners learn much better than those that just sit and listen to people talking like I'm doing now. <laughs> So they come out in the real world and they actually interact with people and they experience the situations that people have to deal with. So it can look like the students are volunteers, but that is only a part of the story. They do have to have some academic learning for me to be involved with it. Now what do yeah. I do? I went fine to this one. Why would we not go? Okay, so IHHE stands for Institutions of Higher Education. And particularly UH Manoa, but also the other institutions in the UH system 
they are uh, financed by the public. They are land, UH Manoa is a land, sea, space and sun grant university. That's actually what it's called. And I think that as such, we have a primary responsibility for uh, educating and researching with the community, things that are important for uh, where we live. So when we started the Palolo Pathway Program, at that, that first it was called Palolo Pipeline Program, but we recently changed that. Um, then it is really was created as an umbrella program because there was so much going on already. So many links, so many initiatives. The overall goal, goal was to improve educational opportunities and quality of life for residents living in this area. Um, at first we were thinking children, but we realized a lot of the adults actually were very happy to uh, take advantage of those opportunities that were created for higher education. And, and that's wonderful. Um, my unit uh, is with the College of Social Sciences. Uh, and we are the leading unit in engagement at the university. And as such, we work closely with uh, the provost and others um, at the university level. Uh, when we started the Palolo Pathway Program, we started working with the, with the Palolo Housing just across the stream. And um, we actually managed to score computers that were the university was going to get rid of and uh, put them in the little uh, house that is called the Halle over there. It's a temporary building. And one of the people that helped us get those computers were the current president of the UH. So he's very aware of what we're doing in the Palolo area. We have many other activities and we uh, focus very much on working across institutions, across disciplines and across communities. So uh, our many other programs that you can see listed here uh, are often intersected with what we do uh, in the Palolo Pipeline program. The three pictures here, you can see the top one is um, a group of international students that uh, are up at the Palolo Ohana Learning Center. Um, the next picture is actually from my student lounge where I have my office at UH in Dean Hall. And the bottom picture are uh, Palolo kids and UH students working in Kailua at Bai Ulupo Heao. So we work across uh, all kinds of levels. There's an interesting story to uh, the international and national visiting programs that we take to Palolo. Um, it's like a, it becomes a cultural exchange, but the thing is that the students that we bring to Palolo, they actually learn more than the students or the children that they're working with in Palolo. And particularly for Japanese students that can be quite shy, an afternoon with the Palolo kid is kind of making the whole change for them. They get so much self-confidence out of it. Oh, somebody can understand what we are saying. They want to do stuff with us. They are just, it really means a lot to them. So again, uh, the university and other institutions are getting as much out of this collaboration, if not more, than the Valley itself. Yeah, our partners, um, it's kind of centered in, in the Palolo Homes and Mutual Housing Association of Hawaii, but uh, we also work with the federal sites as much as they want and let us do it. And then the three public schools that are uh, closest to us here, where we are right now, Jared Middle School and Kaimuki High School as well. When we first started this program, it was really important that uh, we were part of it. Uh, I became kind of a mediator. Uh, as the institutions connected, I was often called in just to be there, or to, be, to be part of it. Um, this was in the early 2000s. That is not at all necessary right, uh, anymore. 
just uh, last week, Thursday, um, Kaimun Key High School had a meeting up at Palolo Learning Center. So there's a lot of connections and it works very well. Um, other uh, entities that we work with in Palolo are uh, the Head Start program and uh, the HCAP Leahi uh, program. Uh, a little bit, not as much as I would like with Ali Ulani Elementary and with Anui Nui. Um, we're working with Olelo Community Media that uh, currently are at Kaimuki High School, Palolo Chinese Home, the District Park, the gym, the boxing instructor over there is one of my old students that now is, uh, has national fame, churches, clubs, Lions clubs, of course, uh, individuals, agencies, organizations, and many more. So it's shifting all the time. You can imagine over 25 years, we've been through quite a few uh, principals <laughs> to schools. And every time it switches, uh, new constellations comes up and new ideas. Um, and I mentioned UH, Manoa, Capiolani, Community College, and Shaminat were the uh, organizations that started but then um, Iolani School has kind of decided to use some of their resources in Palolo as well. So they are running a CAI program that's pretty well known. And then national and international institutions of higher education uh, come in on a regular basis. We had a Swedish university that came for 12 years in a row. We have other uh, partners that also come as much as they can. So um, ideas to how we, uh, we collaborate and what we do uh, are so many. And they come from the kids that we're working with, uh, the students that we're working with, the community members, uh, and also faculty. And it varies very dramatically. Um, one instructor from the Center for Pacific Island Studies had a graduate class that needed to learn how to do surveys. And uh, the Palolo Housing needed a survey. So they got together and they worked together on getting that survey. We, for six years, we were running a, a program called Exploring My Backyard and Beyond uh, with six and seven graders from Yard Middle School. And the truth is, we didn't go through the school, we went through the public house because uh, the paperwork of working with DOE is dramatic. So uh, we went straight to the parents and made agreements with them. Uh, they were, it was two weeks every summer. It felt like yeah. two months. <laughs> it was very labor intensive. Yeah. Would you mind summarizing the remainder of the presentation? This is the last slide. Okay. Yeah. Or next to the last slide. Sorry. We had an international climate change conference mm -hmm. that were partly run by um, the Imua group from Kaimuki High School. So local kids, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians that were um, in danger of flunking. Um, I know you have a special interest in academies and bridges. And this is one of the newer developments coming on right now. Uh, the University of Hawaii at Manoa has more and more academy uh, programs, but also Kaimuki High School has uh, developed academies. KCC has a bridge, um, and there are many of those uh, initiatives. We're, right now, we are in a situation where we're trying to uh, kind of take a look at what have we done, where do we want to go with this, what is really needed today, so uh, what we're going to focus on First and foremost is a needs assessment, and then bringing in the new principal that we now have at Kaimuki High School. So. Question. Sorry, I forgot to put my time. <laughs> okay. Questions from board members. Question. Any questions from board members online? CNN. Any questions from any community members? Okay, so I have a few questions actually. Okay. Um, what kind of internships do you provide the students? Is it specific it, to the CSSC program or? 
No, um, as it turns out, a lot of students from all over the university are taking classes in the social sciences. It's a very popular elective. So in the social sciences, we have a general course for internships, and that can be pretty much anything. It, uh, we have a, an instructor, and then if uh, what the student want to do for an internship is not within what the instructor can handle and to help them with, we call in area uh, specialists. Okay, so, so the interns are undergraduate students. It can be, no, also graduate students. Or, or graduates, yeah. but it's not like um, children in the housing. No, we would not call that internships. We would call yeah. it service learning. Public service. Yeah, Art and we do take them out right. and they do service, definitely. Okay. Um, the other thing, I don't know if you're familiar with the internship program with the Department of Labor. So, yeah, I somewhat. Are you? Okay. Because I can connect you with someone, but the state recently gave um, $5 million to fund internship programs throughout the state. So the university, you know, besides through the course, yeah. they could basically use some of the funding from the Department of Labor through the university and fund interns um, for students in that way. And that it, would be very helpful. It is a big issue with internships, particularly for students that come from less wealthy environments. It's, if you do an internship, you will typically do 10 to 20 hours per week in the internship. And that takes away from your study and from the job or jobs that you need to have. So whenever we can get paid internships, we jump on it. But we also know that there are many nonprofit organizations that can't afford it. Right. And your students are unpaid. Sorry, your interns are unpaid. No, oh, paid. either way. Oh, that's good. Okay, yeah. well, you can use labor's money instead of the university's money. Um, so I will want to learn more about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I took a description with me. You can grab one if you want. Uh, okay, so moving on to board business. So filling up vacancies, are there any community members who are interested in filling one of our vacancies in subdistricts two, three, and four? If you're at all interested, um, Logan, our neighborhood assistant, can check your address to see if you reside in any of those subdistricts. So two, three, and four is basically anything Makai of um, Carlos Long on the Sixth Avenue side, and then I don't know how far down it goes on the Tenth Avenue side. But if you're towards the front of the building, he has the map. Are you interested? No. Oh. <laughs> Anyone interested? Okay. Well, okay. come back next. Month. Uh, <laughs> so the next uh, agenda item is the approval of the um, regular meeting written summary for the video recording. So this is back from our meeting in August. So can we get a motion to approve? Yeah, I move uh, to approve a written summary for video recording of, of Wednesday, August 9th. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Vice Chair Mao. And it was seconded by Board Member Hack. Um, any board members with reservations? Okay, seeing none, the minutes are approved. Woo. Okay, moving on to um, the next agenda item, our reports from our elected officials. Um, do we have a representative from Congressman Case's office? Okay. Okay, um, moving on to the next one, Council Member Say. The floor is yours. Yeah, if you could make your way up to the um, speaker for the participants on Zoom, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, everyone, board members and residents. It's good to see all of you back again. And uh, my report is in the link as for number one. Number two, you know, the past month is, has been very, very busy for all of us at the council. But more importantly, we've been trying to address what is happening with wildfire. So the. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't want to say that. 
You don't have a mic, so you talk in soft. Right. Like this, this is the mic, right? Yeah, I can't hear you talking when you talk. Yeah, that's, that's for okay. the oh. Nothing to do with you, you know what I mean? Okay, no, 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 no problem. Right. That's for online, yeah, it's not on mic. How are you doing yeah. that? Okay, but uh, I'm just happy to be here this evening and to answer any questions that you may have. I must say, last week was really fascinating at the Moilili Makali Neighborhood Board because one of our alumni uh, testified. And you folks recall Stephen Mayberry, the Hawaiian student, Stephen. So he testified in one of the measures and it was nice to see him because he's working for the Waikiki Health Center. So you folks all know that uh, they have opened up Kuahia Street. Next week, we'll be having a meeting with the Kuahia Place residents along with the city to address the restoration of the driveway now. Uh, also, this, today was a day where we had two of our electrical poles replaced up at Lai Road by Hawaiian Electric. And there's a lot of other issues that we uh, had to address, which is the tr trim the vegetation on Keanu Street. We had to follow up on the stream erosion at the bottom part of Palolo Avenue, close to Wailai by the St. Louis School area. Where you folks all know that vacant property on Palolo Avenue. Okay, that is a city and county property, but that's where the accessibility for the sewer pipes that go through it. Uh, we had the uh, <clears throat> fireworks status, so I, I contacted the uh, representative Sayama and Senator Ihara. And then one of them, one of our colleagues or residents asked me if we could get the uh, city to maybe have about not have but to consider a Maui strong license plate for automobiles. So, you know, all this type of issues, but uh, in closing, it's been a very busy week for me also because. Uh, I did introduce a resolution asking the Department of Transportation Services to do a study of Wailai Avenue from 1st Avenue all the way up to 12th Avenue. And the residents of Palolo are very much concerned because as more business increase on Wailai Avenue, the encroachment of the workers' cars on 10th, 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th becomes a problem for them because then they don't have the parking on those particular streets. And that's about it. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you folks may have at this point in time. And Colin, thank you very much for all the questions that you sent Janelle. She's listening. To. <laughs> uh, any questions from board members? No. Yeah, you know, um, yeah Earl. Sorry. Can you hear what you're talking about? Tell you public. Yeah. I'm going to make a complaint with the city, whatever. But what I like you to do in the city council is don't pass no Pakololo. Laws, okay. It's bad for the people. Okay, I give some guys so like they're so good. And don't forget now, a lot of stuff about them is up. So they bit tobacco. Okay. No use it on that stuff. Why are we giving the keys that can stop? You know it's not good for them. You know, I don't want to, I don't want people to get by by the people who, who sell in that stuff. Okay, so that's the most main important mm -hmm. stuff what I mean. Okay. And what are you talking about eight and nine times? I know that's all I can hear. No, no, we're doing a traffic study from 1st Avenue at the bottom of uh, St. Louis Drive, 1st Avenue of Wailai, all the way up to 12th Avenue. There was a big problem now that, and I think you folks know about it, the 8th Avenue in Wailai, the number of accidents that, that has occurred by Punchbowl Fender and the Shell service station, Nakamura. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why this study is being conducted because if you folks also notice on Wailai, there are parklets. Okay. And that took away parking stalls for accessibility. So that's the study that I'm requesting the yeah. Department of Transportation Services to consider doing. Okay. <laughs> okay. And for your, yes. Okay. Yes. It's well, I, I don't believe it's going to be a park. It's number one because 
the way they had shot the quick quick creek. You notice how it's so. Oh, you're talking about Toya Street. That, yeah. That we stopped there. Yeah. It's no park. I right. talked to the guys earlier. It's too steep. That's the reason why they would put the fence over it so nobody can go inside there. Do you mean a green space? I so, I would hope so. Oh. Or maybe later on. Well, I don't know the engineering because if it's going to retain rainwater, then you start the shifting once more of the area. So, you know. Hmm. All right, to to Waimao, to Waimao, yeah. yeah. So they're monitoring it, and that's why those big uh, boxes that you see, that's monitors. It's monitoring the shift of the land. And it's an electrical box with a monitoring in there to measure how much millimeter or centimeter it is moving. But we are trying to retain it. Uh, if you want open space, we have a lot, and you can help me. We have the Azama Park. You folks already recall the Azama, Carol Azama. Abu Aymao, he just passed away, and the area where you see all that vegetation of trees and so forth, that's where I think Rep, Rep Sayama, Rep Senator Ihar, and I, and others are just trying to maintain that particular park. But there's also another park that uh, is a big issue for us also, where you folks see all of the Halikoa trees, the Kipuna, Lamaku area downside, yeah. where Shnabo, the contractor, was base yard there. That area is also part of the city's parks because it's a remnant as far as what it is, as far as those lands. And those lands were acquired by the city from our past residents who sold their properties or we condemned their properties. So that's the history of Waimao. But more importantly, it was, and I think the board members all know that it was a quarry, right, Earl? Yeah. By the way, that's what you did not forget over here, who is history? When they told me that it's open in September, is, is it open? The street is open now, yes. When did they open them? Just about a week ago. A week ago. I warned a week ago. A week ago. Yeah. A week ago. Yeah. Every time I want to check in and stuff, they told me it was September. Well, I think for all of us, I hope you folks understand that government moves slow. Except, except, except for uh, the NCO office, they were very, very efficient. <laughs> Logan is here, you know, right? But uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. It's just nice to be back mm -hmm. rather than just doing it on WebEx or Zoom. Any other questions? Questions from online attendees? Rusty, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Who's on? How many? Who's on? 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 The answer will be provided in the mayor's report, but the question, one of the questions that I have is if Palo meets the criteria of an area with 51% or more low and moderate income households. That I was trying to research it with Janelle and uh, it was very difficult at this point, but I, I believe she did respond to that question, right? As far as is it just the public housing that we were talking about or is it the whole valley in, in itself? Yeah. But so, if it's affecting just the public housing, it would be over 51%. Right. Okay. And I'll be explicit to the board. So um, it'll, it will be provided in the mayor's report, but the Palolo Park hasn't had working lights for over 15 years. Mm -hmm. And there's um, <laughs> in the city and county CIP budget, there was $5 million for a city block grant for park improvements. Yeah. Um, but part of that criteria is that you need to be an area with 51% or more low and moderate income households. So um, my budget is background. So I'm just trying to scrape together funding for our, our oh. community. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Colin, can I make one request yes. on behalf of the city council? 
if the state of Hawaii state government could give us a grant in aid, that would be very beneficial. Grant in aid to the county? Yes. Yeah. And and yeah. the only reason why I say this, you folks have seen me as far as trying to get the fines and forfeitures for, for those unadjudicated violations. And the state of Hawaii was, the, not the state of Hawaii, but the judiciary branch of government, the Traffic Violations Bureau was uh, delinquent in close to 81 million the past uh, 10 years, even though they have a third party collection agency. I thought, this is just me, I thought that we could tie it in with state and county coming together. So who, who does the uh, automobile registration? Start, Beverly. What, city. what age? Huh? City. City. Correct. You're correct. So why can't we tap on the city guys to do something as far as some of the collections? Because Traffic Violations Bureau is with the judiciary. So I'm just trying to bring yeah. these two parties together. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying. But uh, we do need, need money because the police officers need more and more resources also. Mm -hmm. They're asking, the residents are asking us for uh, these uh, noise decibel readers for the noise of automobiles, et cetera. So many different requests that are coming in, just that I can only do so much because I wanted to target this past two months, the issue of uh, non, you know, violations and citations in regards to safety checks. So every morning as I drive on 10th going through YLI, just look at the car in front of you, you look at their license plate and see if the safety st sticker is up to the year that they have it, right? If it's uh, 22 or 23, it's fine, but 21, 22, they haven't uh, got their safety check. And you know, that's the kind of stuff. The other one was the, uh, Oh, none of the elected officials here, but the tinted glass windows. It's hard to measure that too. And that's where it's always HPD that has to enforce these type of uh, penal code. That's in previous. Okay, thank you, Council Member Tay. So, oh, thank you. Our state officials will be working with you to secure funds. Ooh. All right, thank it's you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you folks come in and testify. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think all that's fucking Lolo, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're smoking them now, but. Okay, so next we have um, Deputy Director Warren Mamazuka providing Mayor Glenn Gardy's report. Aloha, good evening, uh, Chair Peros and uh, board members. Uh, my name is Warren Mamazuka. I am the uh, Mayor's uh, representative. Here you go. And uh, I just want to start off with. Uh, the October 2023 edition of the mayor's newsletter, uh, just just several uh, highlights uh, in the in the newsletter. Uh, first, uh, mayor's stance on enforcing public welfare laws. Uh, number two, Safe and Sound Waikiki Initiative uh, marks its first year, and then we have a trio a trio of affordable housing updates, uh, safety tips for fire prevention week. And last, Oahu's parking meters get upgraded, so you can actually uh, uh, log on uh, to oneoahuorg slash newsletter, and you'll be able to see the mayor's uh, October newsletter, yeah. And then uh, moving on to uh, one response, uh, we received an email from uh, Chair Peros, uh, and it was uh, about the outdoor lighting and po at Pololo District Park uh, when it was last operational and why it was removed. So this response is from the Department of Rec uh, Parks and Recreation. Uh, the outdoor court lights at Pololo District Park were removed about 15 years ago due to deteriorate deterioration. At the time, one of the light poles fell down, and after an assessment. All the light poles needed to be removed to ensure public safety. As shared with the neighborhood board previously, the installation of new lighting system at Palolo District Park would be a capital improvement project. The administration manages its CIP based on funding, priority, backlog of existing improvements, and staffing needed to staffing needed to execute and manage these projects. 
When projects are added to our capital projects, capital improvement list, they are considered in context of other newly proposed and existing projects that need to be completed. At this time, Palolo District Park is not on the list for a court lighting capital improvement project. However, we do have other pro existing and recently completed CIP projects at the park that total over $8 million. Recently completed projects include the re-roofing of the re-roofing of the shower building, upgrading the pool deck lights, and making improvements for ADA accessibility to the locker rooms, walkways, doorways, and restrooms. The next phase of CIP includes, includes a re-roofing of the pool pump room, the gymnasium, and other improvements to the gutters and drain lines. Bidding for the gymnasium roof is scheduled for spring 2024. DPR will need to contact the Department of Design and Construction to request an estimate for new court lighting at Palolo District Park. Uh, and I'll take uh, any questions at this time. Okay, questions from board members? Yeah, you have, you have, you have oh, yes. Oh, one person I talked to you about that. Yes. Uh, yes. That's what really we talked to you most about. One year ago, you're longer than that. I don't know why they're not contacting me. On another stuff is a really new song on 10th Avenue. On Wailai, you know the, the line that goes across. When you come from, when you saw Tech Avenue, you saw on the lower side of 10th Avenue. But a park, you know, you get that demarcation line, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. in the repaint them, you know what I mean? You know, people, I have to ask for it, how long we were ready, but, but they got to repaint them. Because a lot of them, people coming down 10 and they say this way, you got no room for God. Already there was seven years, right? And, and they did that, but we got to be paying them back. Okay. And another subject goes on, on 10th Avenue, a lot of lines are already so They should make it all, uh, double, double line all the way down. You know, double line on. You get guys ain't fishing, you know what I mean? You're just trying to cut up. It's dangerous, huh? you know what I mean? So they're just overtaking it, just going down. So that's, that, that's, that's not a thing that main thing about, you know. Same thing with my mouth too. I guess this should know what I mean. When you go up there, you see the line is um faded. So you know, they're gonna repaint them, you know, just repaint the stuff or stuff like that. You know what I mean? Ain't too tough. That place, that place where they this place, you know what I mean? So or in, um it's about an hour, you know, you know, I can talk to you easy now, you know. But I should know, you know, that's the thing I got this open, you know, pay them. You have to wait for me for telling guys over there, they ain't just no more line. I can look into that. Sorry, if I could just uh, clarify. Um, so on 10th Ave and YLI, the intersection, do you want the repainting of the, the waist lines? The double lines in the middle? Yeah, the, cent the center line. The center, the center line. line. Yeah. So there's a line over there. And the turning. So when the... you're coming down 10th Avenue, you don't make a left turn and stay in the way of the guy trying to come up. So the stuff is more out and coming in. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, mean I, fought, I fought for that already, almost five, seven. We got them already. Before never had nothing. You know what I mean? So, but this now it's getting faded, so just repay them. You know? That's all that stuff. And you want double lines on 10th? No, no, they get them already. Just got to repaint them. Repaint. I saw. I read that. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah. That's pretty good because you know it's actually you paint all I want up here. Yeah. If we don't want to one mouth, yeah. you don't have one over there again now, they gotta repaint them. You know, before one car went across the stuff really. When you come in up tent there, if you don't have wire mouth line, they come straight for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, pavement marking is actually uh part of the uh, Department of Facility Maintenance. So yeah. I can check with our, our division of road maintenance road maintenance. So yeah, uh I know that uh you know, our, we have a couple crews uh, as far as uh, for pay, uh, pavement marking. Uh, so I know they're very busy. Uh, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to catch up uh, this entire island with uh, striping. So uh, yeah. can't pick favorites. Right? Can't pick favorites. Uh, 
but we'll do our best. We'll, you know, put this on the radar. Right, yeah. right. Wait a minute. Yeah. Come and check. Yeah. You know, good. We have to see me both. You were talking about fire, uh, fire prevention now, right? Or something. Well, well, that's in the uh, mayor's highlight. The mayor's uh, <laughs> newsletter for October. Well, what I wanted to make sure, like you said, this one here. All of our fire, our uh, state building and city county building, you got to get tests, the sirens, you know what I mean? The but sirens? That's, yeah. that's actually uh, part of the state. Doing the okay, state, the it. state, the state takes care of the uh, all the sirens, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want them guys to yeah. do the right stuff. Yeah. You know, that's what happened down to Maui. You know what I mean? When the fire to Maui, I give a long story. You know what happened? I was when I was an inspector, the guy in the that do the stuff. You know. So Thank you, Member Shiran. Talk to you. the state, to the guys on top, yeah. Yeah, we'll bring it up to um, Representative Sayama if he comes on. But I'll turn it over to uh, board member Kawamoto online. Did you have your hand up for a question? Oops, just... Juanita? Yes, yes, I did. Thank you, Chair Logan. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to reconfirm. So $8 million was put through uh, to do the re-roofing and to do deck work and pool work and ADA lights. Did any of that include more work done on the pool gutters and gym, or is that another funding that has to take place? Yeah, that'll be another project that'll be coming out in uh, 2024. And during this, so 8 million just took care of the re-roofing and the ADA lights and up deck. And so when we requested, because I know we had um, people from the community who wanted to see what uh, what could be done about the lighting near the basketball courts, are we addressing any of that, or is that going to be something that happens after the second funding, and there'll have to be another funding for that? Uh, that. Uh... The Department of Parks and Recreation will be working with the design, the, the, the Department of Design and Construction to request an estimate for new court lighting at Palolo District Park. So, yeah, that will be uh, fiscal year 25 or fiscal year 26. And what was the life expectancy of the poles that were put in that deteriorated? Do uh, we know? I'm not sure. We'll have to get back to you on that. I think that's an important thing when we're talking about what kind of lighting, if we're going to have to redo. And the only reason why I, again, wanted to pay attention to that is because that community that need to have activities for their children or, or enjoy the basketball court can utilize it when people have the time, which sometimes go into the evening time. So, um, and I heard this all last year and into this year. So I just wanted to make sure we're all, it's undocumented, it's been documented that we should try our best to figure out how to help that community that needs to spend time with their family and children. Thank you. Thank you, member Kawamoto. So I, I very Dr. much agree with the sentiment that you're expressing. And just to reiterate, it doesn't sound like the park lights are a priority for um, the administration. So if the board is in favor, we can pass a reso to at least express our um, you know, urgency to get those lights replaced. So. I agree, Chair. So what would the reso look like or can we do something this evening or do we have to wait till next meeting? No, so we would we would we can't take any action today. But once we get the estimate from the Department of Parks and Recreation, then we will be able to identify that amount in the reso. 
So um, I'll, I'll be requesting from the mayor's office also their criteria to prioritize CIP projects, because if it doesn't prioritize lights that have been out for 15 years, then they might have to revise that criteria. Um, okay, any other members from board members? Oh, no more for him, no. no. Questions from the community? <laughs> oh, that's all right, good. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tempe. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. <clears throat> See you next month. Okay. So, um, Ryan, the governor's representative, shared that this is his last week for his deployment on Maui. Um, he's with the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Is is there anyone from the governor's office online? No, right? Okay. Um, I don't see Representative Sayama. Does he have a representative online? Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Evelyn. Good evening, everyone. I'm Evelyn He, um, the office manager for Representative Sayama, who is off island today. Uh, I believe you have our newsletter, which is on link. And I also wanted to share with you two recent Palolo cleanups. One was uh, mentioned by uh, Councilman Say, which is the Izama Park. It's three parcels of land that was left by Carol Azama for the neighborhood. And uh, with the help of Councilman Say and volunteers from the Honolulu Chinese JCs, the Democratic Party of Hawaii, and Kalani High students, um, there was 27 trash bags of green waste that was filled and uh, tossed. So that was a very successful event. Uh, the second cleanup was held in September 30th and uh, volunteers from Sustainable Coastline Hawaii and with our office bringing in 20 Kalani High School students, we were able to help clean up the area along Wailai Avenue and the Makai side of Palolo. Um, so just um, thank you and uh, please let me know if you have any concerns that you would like me to bring back to Representative Sayama. Any questions from board members for Jackson Sayama? Evelyn, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yes, yes. Now, as far as the kind of, um, you can tell Jackson, the rule says that you guys got to make fire alarm tests for all the state buildings and city county buildings. You know, regular fire alarm. Oh, fire alarm. Um, yeah. Now, when you make the fire alarm test, you got to use the regular Hawaii electric 110 volt and the backup battery. You remember the battery now, the one day case of the 110 volt is cut off on Hawaii electric, the battery is supposed to make a bell ring. Okay, so you're going to test that. You have to test that. Okay, and I can tell you later on what happened when I made a test, when I was an inspector. You know, that's right, okay. I told the guy, you gotta do this for the fire. And that guy who was in charge of the building wanted to fight me, okay? So when I heard about the Lahaina one, the guy wanted to fight me on the stuff there. Tell me why picking on him that he have to do all of the tasks and everything, you know? I, I told him on the panel, you gotta put the 110 volts for the fire alarm. You gotta put a big sign, do not turn off at at any time. Okay. So he was going with me to, you know, aggravate me and everything. Then I went up into the main building and look at the file on panel. And we put on the file on panel. And on the regular one, the bell rang. Then we put it on to the, the very backup. And then we pull the station and the stuff only went burnt for five seconds. You know what that means, eh? You know, you don't have that, right? That's your 100% safety gun. On Lahaina, when I think about the guys that who had poop, all burnt inside out, we had no warning. And this is what brought me 18 years ago, that eh, when I made the test. You know, that's how I went to inspect them. You know what I mean? And I went through everything, make sure. You gotta do those things, you know what I mean? You don't wanna see nobody get cooked and burned, not even get warning. You know, nobody's talking about that now. They're talking about how they go rebuild them. But me, I'm thinking about the guy who, who was in a building not doing nothing and he got off. Oh, that is something, guys. 
You know how many people that is? So I saw this thing where I said, you gotta make 100% test on the smoke with the battery. You gotta run, you gotta run the battery too now, not, not just 110 volts. Okay, and you gotta give them detector saying the grading of the bell, of the of the battery is 100 percent You know how you put battery stuff. Yeah, gotta be. Sure. And yeah. that's real important now, you know. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it already happened to me 18 years ago when nobody like do that stuff and I did them and the stuff never ring because the battery was dead. Thank you, Evelyn. So to follow up on that, um, the subcommittees that the House formed to address the Maui disaster, is that specific to provide relief or um, proposed legislation for Maui specific, or is it to address fire prevention policies statewide? Do you know? Uh, I believe, well, I, I know it's for, it was all initiated because of the Maui, and I'm sure some of what they're gonna find out can be used statewide, but um, I believe I can um, have Rep Sayama answer more in detail. Okay, yeah, because I think it's a, um, you know, lessons learned from Maui seems to be a priority for uh, some of our right. board members. So if we could think of how we can kind of utilize those subcommittees to address these fire alarm issues, some of the, Fire suppression issues that board member Kawamoto brought up, then we can. That might be the best avenue to address these concerns. So we can bring it to Rep. Sayama's yeah. attention next time. Sayama, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, any other? No, Jackson, let me see, man. <laughs> I'll let him know. Thank I you. I agree, Miss Ladero. Any questions from board members online? Questions for from the community. Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Thank Emily. you. Thanks for stepping in. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um. So Senator Yamara mentioned that he was unable to make the meeting. So, um, that brings us to the end. And I usually will not read the announcements because they are boilerplate. But I'm going to read two today. So, um, the Jared Foundation is holding their 2023 um, dinner, and it's to celebrate Dr. Ree Fuba, the principal for Jared Middle School. And in 2021, he was selected by the Hawaii's principal. He was selected as Hawaii's principal of the year by the National Association of Secondary Principals. So this dinner is taking place on Saturday, November 18. And if you would like to um, join that celebration, then please contact me. Um, there is some more information in the um, share folder online. And if you are moved by um, Wei Li's presentation about trees, the second announcement I want to read is um, a volunteer opportunity that happens twice a month. It's every first and third Wednesday um, from 4 to 6 p.m. It's a stream cleanup that happens um, in the back of Lola Valley. So with that, I adjourn the meeting at 834. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Thank you. good. Right, Alex. Okay, okay, okay. 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 okay.